Um, I'm so excited to introduce to you the Bel Air Ensemble. Um, this uh, group is the coolest. I'd be so pleased to have them as friends, to have them. Um, two of the people on stage today you'll um, recognize as alumni of our fine school, um, and the third is just fabulous. So you're uh, in for a real treat um, to get to meet this group. Um, I'm gonna let them tell you about them, um, but they have been, for the last couple years, uh, providing parlor concerts. Um, rather than trying to book line tall, they're trying to book small spaces where they really can make an impact on specific small crowds of people um, and to have just been reading rave reviews for winning competitions um, and really doing some great repertoire. So without further delay, the Bell Art Ensemble. <laughs> Soprano as a, with pants rolled, uh, with a pants roll. Um, he's saying that after the <coughs> tempest, 
you can see light and everything will be fine and even after the shadows there are hope to be to be had in the in the future
Uh, so as Mr. Neely uh, introduced us, we're, we are actually three-fifths of the Bell Art Ensemble. Uh, in addition to the three of us here on stage, we also have a, a violinist who is uh, busy at this point uh, having a baby, so she kind of gets the, uh, the, this concert off. And we have a second pianist. So with oboe, violin, mezzo <coughs> soprano, and two pianists, we can do a great variety of subgroupings of that. We can have a quartet, we can have three different trios, we can have uh, duos, and we can even have piano four hands, where two people are sitting at the, at the piano keyboard. So it allows us to explore many different um, uh, histories of music, uh, many different kinds of genres of music. Um, as a matter of fact, what we just did there with uh, the two opening Baroque pieces were two types of Baroque music that combines voice and instrument. The Bavak was originally for voice with a, a solo instrument called an obbligato. The second one we did, the opera uh, excerpt, is actually, uh, we arranged it from the original opera score. So we arranged out, uh, we've also done this with violin and oboe, kind of playing their orchestral parts and the piano backing us up. Um, so we're uh, basically playing a couple of selections from a concert that we gave uh, last week, uh, talking about the, the music that we do, the, the type of chamber music we do specifically, music uh, involving instruments and voice, which is not quite so common. Usually you just have a, a solo singer or, a, or an instrumental group. Um, but I'm gonna do a, a couple of pieces here by um, a Brazilian composer, Jose Siqueira. Um, equally <coughs> famous in his own country as a, as a conductor and as a composer and as a teacher. Um, his music uh, is very interesting because it combines elements of neoclassicism. Uh, if you think back all the way to our music history class, we talked about the two streams of the 20th century, the serial stream and the neoclassical stream. Siqueira was firmly in the neoclassical stream using scales and chords and those sorts of things, but in, he introduced a lot of Brazilian elements, some Brazilian rhythms and some pentatonic scales. So I'm gonna do the first two of these three etudes uh, that he wrote for oboe and piano.
19th century French composer Gabriel Fauré. Uh, something, I don't know if some of you speak French. Are fluent. So, so, a characteristic of the French music is the way it, the, the music is set to the, to the gesture of, of the French language, which is really silky and, move, and moves forward, like almost water through your fingers. And, and it's also almost um, that you can look at uh, is, uh, is descriptive almost like if you were looking at post-impressionistic paintings as well. So I ask you to follow the poems to find those effects in them.
the Bellard Ensemble operates, or has been operating for the past five years, what we call the Living Room Chamber Music Project. It's basically uh, a way for us to be able to pull new people into chamber music and into classical music in general by taking concerts out of concert halls and into private spaces. So what we do is we ask people who live in the city of Pittsburgh who have pianos to host us at their house for a concert. Um, and it started, we actually did 10 performances in a year at 10 different houses uh, the first year that we did it. And now we do uh, one program every other month and usually at two or three different houses. So we usually end up paying, playing for about 100, 120 people every other month. Um, and it, it's been working out uh, very, very well because I'm sure all of you uh, in your regular lives, you have friends who don't know a thing about your classical music life, right? They just, they have their own music, they don't even like classical music, and they kind of, maybe they respect what you do, but they have no clue what you do. So this for us was a way of taking those friends of ours who are, you know, intelligent, uh, you know, um, willing to do things, but just have this weird blind spot when it comes to classical music. Either they think it's, it's too stuffy, or you need to know too much, or it's a little too boring. And we try to bring those people into the fold by proving that, yeah, by proving what we know, and I'm sure all of you know, that this music has power, emotional power, and it's, and it's very enjoyable. Uh, so we usually do concerts where we do a variety of stuff with a variety of different periods, a variety of different styles, and a variety of different instrumentations. Uh, this piece here, uh, written by Henri Tomasi, is actually for unaccompanied oboe. I'm going to be doing two of the four movements here. He wrote this piece um, after he had finished his career as a conductor, um, and he had uh, time to do a lot of different compositions. Uh, this piece is based, each one of them is based on a different country. So the first one is Peru, and the second one is uh, is Nigeria. Now these are not authentic folk melodies, these are kind of uh, fermented through Tomasi's own brain and his kind of French style, but they do have uh, some extra musical elements. So in the first movement you're going to be hearing the sounds of drums and of, uh, and of uh, um, kind of uh, religious cries, and then in the Nigerian movement you're going to hear uh, the theme for what he called a, 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 um, a sprightly antelope and then a crouching lion kind of their uh, confrontation. You can probably hear at the end who, uh, what happened in terms of did he or did he not kill the antelope. This are, these are two of Henri Tomasi's evocations for solo oboe.
sort of. Um, so, because the nature of this ensemble is really heterogeneous, there's not a whole lot of repertoire for the whole ensemble, right? Like you would go and find lots of stuff for a string quartet or even piano trio. So we kind of have to go hunting. Some of the things we find as is, like the Bach piece that began with, some of the piece we alter a little bit by kind of shrinking the orchestra down to oboe and violin and piano as we did with the, with the handle. Um, some of the pieces like the foray or the sequera are already there and we incorporate it into a smaller portion of the ensemble. And then we uh, actually do a lot of writing and arranging. Um, I've done some writing and arranging for the group. We've uh, commissioned uh, several people to compose for the entire ensemble. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the, pe the piece that we're going to play next was actually composed by our second pianist, uh, Jack Kuritz. Uh, he actually was in charge of, a, of a, um, a high school program this year in Pittsburgh called From Note to Finish, where myself and another composer worked with student composers to, uh, to write pieces of music. And uh, Jack thought that he better put up or shut up, so he decided that he was going to write a piece as well. Uh, none of us knew that he was doing this, and he kind of sprung it on us, like, hey guys, I, I wrote a piece. Um, which is great. I know that some of you guys are composition majors or write music as well. The best people to write for are your friends because they're going to be excited to do something of yours. So whoever you have, that's who you should be writing for. I mean, of course, you should be doing your composition assignments, but it's so great to be able to hear a piece done by live people and not like the MIDI playback on your computer. So this is a lullaby. Uh, Jack actually wrote the poem as well. Ten years ago. Ten years ago. Um, and this is, a very, uh, this is a very interesting piece to be able to look at how we deal with two melodic instruments, including the voice. In the interplay, each of us at one point has some kind of melodic material. So part of the art of being able to play um, together, especially combining an instrument and a voice, is learning when to move into the foreground and when to blend into the back. So see if you can hear that, that interplay of the different melodic voices in this piece.
we have one more piece for you, and then um, if you have any questions for us about uh, what we do here or individually about uh, about our training or how we got here, um, Billy Joe and myself, we both uh, attended Carnegie Mellon. Um, Raquel uh, did her artist diploma in Duquesne, uh, at, du at Duquesne University, and before that she was uh, she was doing most, she did most of her training in Argentina. Um, the last piece we're going to do is um, is an igun. It's kind of uh, the Jewish equivalent of gospel music, in that a rabbi and the congregation kind of sing this uh, in a responsorial fashion. It's uh, Yamin Aloshem. This actually came about because one of Raquel's um, students was going to be performing on a music of Jewish song and stories, and asked me if I would take this melody and arrange it for this instrumentation, because there was another oboist then another pianist that was gonna do this piece. Um, and I gladly did, and it turned out to be uh, so nice that we decided to keep it and, and work it into our concerts as well. So this is Yamin Adoshem. Say it again. Uh, we actually, uh, believe it or not, we, um, and this sounds really corny, we met on a gig. Because uh, I, um, I also sing in the Pittsburgh Camerata, and she was brought in as a soloist. So we met in a reception after, the, after one of the performances. So. Do we make a great couple? Huh? Yes. Hi, 
So the violinist and I played a concert in uh, Winter Park, Colorado, which is where I uncle lived. And that was a house concert series, which had actually grown and moved into a church. So I kept, you know, picking her aunt and uncle's brains about it. It was really cool, you know, it was a small place and they were inviting people to come in and play in their homes, there's food, there's drinks, it's nice. It's really, you know, it was really casual. They loved the music. I looked at the violinist and I said, do you think we can do this at home from our end? I happened to be working with Raquel at the time. We were preparing a concert, which is funny because I said, you know, I'm like, oh, oh, the competition. Right, and uh, oh, well, yeah, who's your husband? Oh, his name is Lenny. Oh, really? How many Lennys can there be in Pittsburgh? Lenny and I went to school together like a million years ago. So I already knew Lenny. Jack and I had talked about doing a series, and so we just kind of all got together. And, you and know. The, the five of us have a very um, a huge love for chamber music, and that's something that we all performed separately in our lives. So it just came very naturally to do chamber music together. Plus, uh, you know, there's a lot of websites that allow people, like homeowners, to, to book traveling acts for house concerts. There's several, like, house concert booking websites. But for that, it's like the people who own the house book the act. And for the most part, it's, um, you know, they were either singer-songwriter or Americana acts, but some sort of, like, either pop or kind of light rock act. So what we wanted to do was kind of turn that on its head, and instead of having the the host book the concert, have us actually produce the concerts and find hosts for us to, to, to perform, kind of like a, a, basically a concert series. Somebody else? Come on, you're thinking it. Myself? So I am from Argentina, and I did my, I, started, I am from Cordoba, Argentina, which is in the center of, of, this, of the country. And I first studied there, I went to a performing arts school since I was four, and then I moved to Buenos Aires, the capital of the country, to do a master's at the Colón Opera House. And after that, I, I got a full scholarship to come to, to Pittsburgh to study at Duquesne. And I keep the training, of course, going to every single program, taking <coughs> lessons, and so on and so forth. How many singers do we have here? A lot Whoa. this year. Quite a number. Great. So, uh, have any, uh, any anybody ever ever? Uh, if you're a singer, have you ever had a chance to work with an instrumentalist other than a pianist? Or if you're an instrumentalist, have you had a chance to work with a work to work with a singer mm -hmm. to do something? There, there is quite a bit of uh, of, en of ensemble work out there. A lot of this stuff for instrument and voice and piano tends towards the Baroque. And again, if you look for like a solo with an obligato instrument, you can find things for like flute or violin uh, or oboe. Um, there's a couple of pieces in the classical period. The most famous is probably the Shepherd on the Rock for soprano and clarinet and piano. But there's, there's a number of pieces that involve, uh, that involve an instrument. For instrumentalists, performing with a, with a singer is both a great, uh, it's both a wonderful thing and a challenge because usually the singer makes you look good, right? So the singer has well. like, all of the star appeal and the you know and all of the text and all of that stuff and you're just kind of the side man. And we dress really well. Uh, the the challenge when <laughs> when performing with like a single note instrument and a and a singer is that intonation becomes really crucial, especially if you come to like unisons or octaves. If you're out of tune, the intonation <coughs> becomes really really critical. And also looking at the relationship between the two parts, which one is more important, which one has to be in the background, and kind of adjusting your color and sometimes your volume uh, to match that. Um, there's some singers who could, you could you know, be playing a, uh, you know, a fortissimo and they would totally sing over you. Other, other singers have a little bit more of a quieter color so you need to kind of back off on the volume that you would use like in an orchestra in a band setting. But uh, it's, it's really, 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 really fun to do and a great kind of change of pace from either doing things in a choir or just with a pianist if you're a, if you're a singer or doing things just with other instrumentalists. And I'm sorry for the from the singer's perspective. If you love doing chamber music, there is is never uh, no one is ever accompanying you. You are making music with that person. So it's it's, it's it's really a team a teamwork, and the music is written for both or for the team. So there is not it's not such a thing that we stay in a format as much as we want in an area. Like many times in the opera world happens. Um, you, you become a way more smart musician, and that is what the world needs. From the pianist's perspective, I worked here for years. I played for almost every 
thing, voice for a while. I did a lot of instruments. I did about 10 years in a violin studio here. So doing this kind of came naturally out of what I already did. And then it gets more fun because, you know, we invite other instruments then. We've invited the cellist, we've invited the flutist, and so we're exploring repertoire that we've never done, which is really cool. And one of the biggest compliments that we get, one of the biggest draws for us is the fact that our repertoire is so varied and so cool. I just had a woman, I actually hosted, we can play in a small space as well, because I have a small house. And one of the ladies at my concert kept going on and on, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go to the library. I love these composers, I've never heard of them. You know, I wanna go find this stuff. And that's one of our biggest strengths, I think. Yeah, we usually try to mix some like real meat and potatoes kind of names with some more uh, obscure people. And as an oboist, I usually am the one who brings up the obscure people because I run out of meat and potatoes <laughs> composers very quick in my, in my repertoire. <coughs> Um, the other thing about having the two pianists is great because our other pianist, Jack, uh, does much more solo work. So for instance, on our last concert, Jack played two, piece, two solo pieces by Rachmaninoff. So we have all of these different combinations, all of these different things that we can bring in order to, in order to sculpt our programs. It doesn't have to be just, just the same. Plus, if we have somebody out for whatever reason, uh, we can build around that and, and bring in guests. So like, you know, if the string quartet is missing a cellist, it's kind of like, well, they can't really play. But uh, we can still... Uh, adapt because our instrumentation is so flexible. All right, so we're going to be really kind and let you guys go. Um, if you want, if you have any other individual questions that you were afraid to ask or whatever, just come up and talk to us. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much. You're a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.